Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Che Alaska webinar, which is on the dangers of deep sea mining. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm the communications coordinator with Alaska Community Action on Toxics, or ACAT. Um, che Alaska is a program of ACAT and Collaborative for Health and Environment, and it's also part of Che's broader international coalition of over 5,000 individuals across the globe. Um, during today's webinar, our chat function is disabled, but please feel free to send in your questions um, at any point using the Q&A box feature. Um, please send them at any point and we'll get to them at the very end within the hour that we have. Um, so for today's webinar, we're so glad to have Farah Obaidullah joining us. Farah is the founder of the nonprofit, The Oceans and Us. Uh, the Woman for Oceans platform, and she's also the editor of the book, The Oceans and Us. Um, thanks so much for being here, Farah, and I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just one thing, it's the ocean and us, just to avoid uh, yeah misunderstanding. We're trying to sort of promote the ocean as one, uh, as all connected and being one ocean. Um, but before I begin, I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge um, all the lives everywhere around the world affected by war and by the climate crisis. It is my belief that restoring nature and rediscovering our place in the natural world goes hand in hand with peace. If we don't have respect for nature, we won't have respect for each other. And as the saying goes, you can judge a character by the way they treat other li living beings. And this can be extended to the natural world and all life. How we treat the natural world around us is a reflection of how we treat one another. But I'm here to talk about the ocean and why a healthy ocean matters. In particular, I will discuss the high seas, the deep sea, and the Ocean Hope Expedition, a journey connecting people to the ocean, celebrating the high seas, and preventing the disaster that is deep sea mining from starting. I hope to offer you new insights and I welcome questions and a discussion after my talk. I'll just uh, hit present here. And these slides are basically, uh, they will just be playing in loop <laughs> as I speak, um, but just to add some atmosphere to the talk. So the ocean means different things to each one of us. We each see the value of the ocean and therefore the approach to protecting it differently. There is no one size fits all. Raising awareness about the ocean is all well and good, but if there's one thing that I've learned over 20 years of campaigning for the health of the ocean, we have to feel connected to the ocean in order for us to care. We only protect what we love and feel connected to, and we only love or feel connected to that which we know. And this is why bringing in diverse perspectives is also so important so that we can reach as many people as possible. Now, we need all hands on deck. So what is important to me about the ocean is different to you, but one thing is common, we all need healthy oceans, whether to stabilize our climate, feed our family, or out of an ancestral and cultural heritage. So let's explore the ocean. We know that the ocean covers 70% of the planet and provides 90% of the planet's habitable space. We know that the ocean gives us life. Much of the oxygen that we breathe and that is in our atmosphere today is derived from the ocean. The ocean provides us with food, jobs, and well being. And importantly, the ocean regulates our climate. Yet we also know that the health of the ocean is in serious decline. Climate change, overfishing, and pollution are all wreaking havoc to life in the oceans and its ability to carry out the functions that sustain life as we know it. Did you know, for example, that most of the world's fish stocks are either fully fished or overfished, or that one in five fish is caught illegally, or that a staggering 10 to 15 million tons of plastic ends up in the ocean each year, and that the oceans are warming, acidifying, and losing their oxygen content as a result of climate change? Corals, one of the most iconic forms of life in our ocean, are set to almost completely disappear by the middle of this century. And that's not so very far anymore. And all of this is deeply depressing, and most people I encounter don't know what they can do to change things. Just 10 years ago, ocean plastic pollution was arguably the only major issue that gained widespread public attention. And as a result, we are seeing some commitments to curb the plastic crisis, although still not nearly enough is being done. 
the United Nations is not only now in the middle of developing and negotiating a global plastics treaty. But the increasing challenges that the ocean faces can no longer be left to scientists, conservationists, and activists alone. Just like a sinking ship requires all of us to mobilize, we must now have all hands on deck to safeguard our lifeline, the ocean. And as our understanding of the ocean increases, so too do the opportunities for exploiting resources. So whilst you and I are grappling with these challenges and finding ways as ocean and nature lovers, scientists, environmentalists, and concerned citizens to do what we can, what is in our power to mitigate these problems by, for example, ditching single-use plastics, abstaining from seafood, or reducing our carbon footprints, there is a new threat that looms for the ocean, deep sea mining. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I first wanna spend a bit of time on my favorite part of the ocean, the high seas. This is quite literally the middle of the ocean, those areas of the ocean that are beyond the national jurisdiction of any one nation. The high seas make up over two thirds of the ocean, which translates to almost half of our planet. And why is this my favorite part of the ocean? They belong to no one and therefore belong to all of us. As someone raised by parents of two very different cultures, having attended international schools and having had the privilege of traveling through much of the world, I feel connected to the high seas. Just as the high seas are international waters, so too am I an international citizen. But I also spent time roaming some of the high seas and I have experienced firsthand what the challenges are of governing this vast part of our planet. The high seas are largely ungoverned. They are like the wild west of the ocean. Sure, there is a patchwork of organizations and treaties aimed at managing some of our activities on the high seas, such as regional fisheries organizations, the International Seabed Authority, and so on. But these instruments look at only one activity, area, or set of commercially interesting fishes. There is no single comprehensive framework that protects life on the high seas. And yes, just last year, after 20 years of negotiations, we now do have a treaty designed for the sustainable use and protection of life in areas beyond national jurisdiction. But this treaty still needs to be ratified and entered into force. Moreover, the provisions of this treaty are such that they cannot undermine existing instruments, frameworks, and bodies. So it may still be a few years before the new High Seas Treaty takes effect, and just how effective this treaty will be will be determined by the political will of those in power. So what do I mean by the challenges of governing activities on the high seas? Remember, I just mentioned that one in five fish is caught illegally. Well, over the years, I spent time documenting fish crimes at sea. What are fish crimes? They include a whole host of activities from fish and money laundering to human trafficking, labor abuse, and slavery at sea. But when we talk about fish being caught illegally, more specifically, we mean illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing or IUU fishing. And just quickly for, for your benefit, illegal fishing quite simply means fishing in contravention of applicable laws regarding fish size, net size, area closures, and so on. Unreported fishing means just that, fish that is caught, but is not officially reported anywhere or that is misreported. An example of this is high grading where a vessel continues to fish beyond their quota in search of only the highest grade fish, replacing previously caught fish within that quota with higher value specimens. So they'll literally discard fish just to replace it with higher value specimens. Finally, unregulated fishing is all fishing that happens by vessels not bound by regional fishing bodies in areas where no management regime exists or by vessels that target fish for which there are no applicable rules. So with the patchwork of instruments and the fact that not all countries are bound to fishing rules on the high seas, for example, if they are not party to the relevant fisheries management organizations, the high seas are a perfect playground for unregulated fishing. Moreover, the lack of eyes and ears on the high seas or monitoring, surveillance and enforcement means that fish crimes are rife in these vast areas. But importantly, there is a lack of clear accountability on the high seas. Let me explain what I mean. On one of my expeditions documenting fish crimes, 
Our crew bore witness to a transshipment happening on the high seas in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean, involving multiple catcher vessels and a reefer flag to Cambodia. So transshipment basically means the transfer of catch from one vessel, usually the catcher vessel to another vessel, usually the refrigerated cargo vessel or reefer. So we boarded and inspected the reefer to find that the kept captain kept no logbooks detailing the transfer of catch, how much, and from which boat. No crew manifests and no details, even of the ships that he was offloading from. Now, I was used to boarding ships with a bridge filled with high-tech screens, radars, and communication gadgets. And this ship had the bare minimum, no screens, no gadgets. The captain had a handheld GPS, global positioning system, and a satellite phone. He took orders from his boss on land, who would call him with the coordinates of where to go. It was as simple as that. The ship's hold was the size of a basketball court, several meters high, with filled with three quarters uh, full of mostly skipjack tuna. And there was no way of knowing where any of it is caught or by whom. The fact that we were on the high seas and that the reefer was flagged to a country that was not a member of the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, that was the body charged with managing tuna in that area, made it impossible for us to alert anyone with authority. The closest territorial waters and therefore country was Palau. For the entire expedition, we had Palauan enforcement officers on board, even while this incident unfolded. So I made a call to the Attorney General's office of Palau, and as expected, Palau, although willing, was powerless to act. I made the point that the ship would be passing through Palauan waters on its way to the Philippines, and still Palau was unable to act. We trailed the ship for a few days and witnessed it changing names. They had also conveniently covered their IMO number. This is a number that is unique to the vessel and should not change, even if the name or flag does. So this case illustrated all too well the lack of governance on the high seas and the desperate need for better international cooperation. We had all the information about the vessels in question, including visual evidence of transshipment, lack of proper catch data, and documented the overt change of name as well as dumping of fuel at sea. We knew where the ship was destined for, and yet there was nothing we could do and no one we could alert to stop this illegal catch from reaching the global tuna market. Now, such stories, unfortunately, abound on the high seas. And it is for this reason that I am very concerned about the emerging threat of deep sea mining. So what is deep sea mining? Deep sea mining is a destructive extractive industry that doesn't yet happen on the high seas. It is quite literally the practice of mining the seabed for minerals. If allowed to go ahead, and there's a very real risk that it can happen as early as next year, Deep sea mining will cause irreversible damage to life in the deep ocean and risks disturbing locked away carbon. The ocean is the world's largest carbon sink and most of that carbon is locked away in the seabed, sending gargantuan machines to the bottom of the ocean to strip mine it for minerals is quite literally an experiment in ocean chemistry we cannot afford. And let's explore the deep sea for a moment. The deep sea is defined as the ocean below 200 meters. I think that's something like 600 feet, and can extend for kilometers or miles down, the deepest point being the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean at some 11,000 meters below the surface. I think that translates to about uh, seven uh, miles deep. The deep sea makes up about 90% of the volume of the ocean and 95% of the Earth's livable space. Most of the deep ocean is in the high seas. And given this vast size, it is no surprise then that the deep sea boasts a wide range of topographical features, including mountains or seamounts, far taller than the tallest peaks found on land, as well as gullies and underwater hydrothermal vents, and of course, a wealth of undiscovered life. The deep sea has largely remained undiscovered because technology is only now advancing to allow us to access and explore it. In fact, 99% of the deep ocean is yet to be discovered, but there may be as many as several million species living down there. What we do know about the deep ocean is that it is rich in biodiversity and that life in the deep sea is vulnerable. That's because under such enormous pressure with no light, life is very slow growing and very slow to reproduce. 
Fish such as orange ruffy can reach over 200 years old and only reach sexual maturity at about 30. You may have heard of the Greenland shark, a deep sea shark that can reach over 400 years old. Corals can even reach several thousand years old and sponges can reach at 10,000 years old. And speaking of corals, over half of the world's corals are actually found in the deep sea. So with life growing so slowly in the deep ocean, you can imagine that it responds poorly to disturbance. In fact, we know that when we cause damage to deep sea habitat through, for example, deep sea bottom trawling, it will take decades, if not hundreds of years for life to return. We also know through studies published in 2021 that disturbing the seabed through bottom trawling releases vast quantities of carbon back into the ocean and then atmosphere. Some parts of the deep ocean are also rich in mineral deposits, and it is these minerals that a handful of speculative mining companies want to exploit. These deposits essentially come in three forms that are interesting for miners. The polymetallic nodules found along the abyssal plains of the deep ocean, they are about the size of a lump of coal and sit on the seabed. They are rich in nickel, cobalt, and manganese. These nodules have taken millions of years to form and provide essential habitat for animals, such as the Casper octopus, which lays her eggs around these nodules. The second type are the polymetallic sulfides from hydrothermal vents. Deep sea hydrothermal vents support some of the most unique and ecologically important communities known to science. In fact, an enzyme isolated from a microbe found in the deep sea hydrothermal vents is used in the COVID-19 test. The third type of deposits are the cobalt crusts found on seamounts. But it is the polymetallic nodules on the deep sea bed that are of interest in the short term to miners, and specifically those in, in an area known as the Clarion Clipperton Zone, or CCZ, in the Pacific Ocean. In fact, some of you may have read about the CCZ in the news over the past uh, year or so, and the fact that more than 5,000 new species were recently discovered in the area. Basically, every time we go down into the deep sea, we're discovering new species because there's just so much we have yet to explore and therefore yet to discover. So deep sea mining for the nodules involves strip mining the deep, uh, the seafloor, essentially sucking up these nodules and leaving a wake of destruction in its path. So aside from the direct and immediate destruction of deep sea habitat, Deep sea mining will cause plumes of sediment along the seafloor and in the water column as the nodules are transported up to the surface, which could spread for many square miles beyond the actual mining areas. This suspended sediment risks suffocating life in the water column as well as life on the seabed as it settles down on the ocean floor again. Wastewater and noise pollution from the deep sea, from deep sea mining will further impact life in the ocean. And what I mean by wastewater is that once the nodules reach the surface and are collected on board the ships, they are cleaned of sediment, which will then be released back in the ocean, causing secondary plumes. And we know that these nodules are rich in metals and therefore in the, in, in the process of cleaning them and releasing that wastewater, it's likely that we will be releasing toxic wastewater back into the ocean. And then by what is essentially dredging the seabed for nodules, collecting as much as 30 centimeters of seabed sediment beneath the nodules, there is a very real risk that the carbon that is locked away in the seabed gets released into the water column. Now we don't yet understand what the consequences of that will be. And even if you imagine that it may take a long time for the carbon to reach the surface again, it may in the meantime interfere with the ocean's biological pump and carbon cycle. For example, it may exacerbate ocean acidification. And also you may have seen this summer, some very exciting news. Um, a group of scientists actually funded by one of the most aggressive companies pushing to begin deep sea mining, no less, discovered that the very nodules that the miners want to rip from the ocean floor actually produce oxygen through the electrolysis of seawater. And this is an incredible scientific breakthrough. Oxygen was always seen as a product of photosynthesis by plants, whether on land or in the ocean. And the fact that we now have another source of oxygen opens up a whole new world of scientific discovery. And this is news that the global community cannot push aside. It would make sense, therefore, that before we begin to pursue such a high risk and irreversibly destructive new industry, 
that we at least understand fully what we are getting ourselves into. And this is exactly what scientists are saying. In fact, more than 800 scientists, marine scientists, are calling for a pause to deep sea mining. We are currently living through the sixth mass extinction. We have already lost more than two thirds of global wildlife. The climate and biodiversity crises are upon us. And now as the world pours its attention to issues affecting us on land, such as war, energy, the cost of living crisis, this reckless industry is poised to take foot. And once it does, we will see a new gold rush begin, a race to the bottom of the ocean for minerals. So who is in charge of allowing or not allowing deep sea mining in the high seas, our global commons to go ahead? Well, there is this international organization called the International Seabed Authority or ISA, established under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And this body is tasked with regulating any future mining activities. And in doing so, it must ensure the effective protection of the deep sea, recognizing that the deep sea is designated as the common heritage of humankind. The ISA is made up of 167 members and the European Union. The USA is not one of them. The US is an observer of uh, to the International Seabed Authority and sits on the back benches together with the nonprofit organizations. The ISA has so far granted 31 deep sea mining exploration contracts, uh, amounting to an area of 1.3 million square kilometers licensed to date. And there are a couple of aggressive companies sponsored by countries pushing to mine the deep sea at all cost. And as with everything, once one country starts mining, then the floodgates open to all the other countries to mine, remembering that there are already 31 exploration licenses. But momentum is building rapidly to stop this emerging industry. Frontline communities of where this industry wants to begin Mining, the Pacific Island communities, reject deep sea mining. Hundreds of NGOs and civil society groups are saying no to deep sea mining. Fishing associations are saying no to deep sea mining. The ocean community from divers to surfers are saying no to deep sea mining. And right now, as of today, 32 countries are calling for a moratorium or pause on deep sea mining. And just a little anecdote, uh, one of the um, umbrella organizations of the world's largest fishing vessels, who I've been campaigning against for you know, most of my career because of the overfishing that they cause, um, they actually called me last year uh, to, to ask me to come and explain why they should be concerned about deep sea mining. So it's amazing to see how you know, we're all uniting on this issue that we don't want deep sea mining to happen. And as I said, hundreds of scientists are calling for a pause to developing this industry. And even tech and electric vehicle companies and the finance, finance sector are saying no to deep sea mining. Companies like BMW, Volvo, Volkswagen, Renault, Google, Apple, Samsung, and Philips, to name a few, are rejecting the idea that we need minerals from the deep ocean for our supply chains. They have the foresight to realize that trashing the seabed is not the way out of the climate crisis. Banks are also increasingly excluding deep sea mining from their investment policies. Just this week, Deutsche Bank announced that they will not uh, invest in deep sea mining. In short, there is no social license to start mining our common heritage. And it's not that hard to imagine why. It is a reckless industry that has no place in the future we are trying to build for our collective good. One that is based on a circular, not linear economy, where take, break, waste is no longer the business model. And it is an industry that is easy to reject. It isn't happening yet. No jobs are at stake. But we know that once it starts, it will be very difficult to stop or even regulate. How are we even going to audit this industry? Who has the jurisdiction or money to go down several kilometers into the ocean depths to see if miners are following the rules? How will we regenerate these areas? Thinking back to my example of unregulated fishing, how are we going to hold companies and countries to account? Who will spend the political capital to uphold regulations in an area that belongs to no one? We can't make the same mistakes as in our past. Look at how long it's taking us to wean off of fossil fuels. And that's because for so long, governments and companies have argued that there is too much at stake. Too many jobs, too much investment in infrastructure from extraction to distribution. I get it, it's a gigantic ship to turn. But with everything we know about how destructive deep sea mining is, why even begin? 
And here's the thing we don't need to. Those that want to mine the deep sea argue that we need the minerals found in the deep sea, like cobalt, manganese, and nickel, to power electric vehicles and our tech gadgets. But this argument is flawed. For one, there are enough, enough minerals on land to meet the demand for metals, even the industry says so. Although yes, we absolutely must improve the way we mine on land. But also, why aren't we recovering metals from our waste streams? Why are we dumping and incinerating waste that contains these precious metals? Why isn't urban mining a thing? One recently published study says we can meet up to 58% of our demand for metals just by recovering them from waste streams. Innovations such as bioleaching are already making promising breakthroughs in recovering metals from waste. Why aren't we investing in that? But probably the biggest argument for not needing these metals from the deep sea is because battery technology is evolving at a fast pace. Big companies like Tesla, BYD, the, that's the world's second largest producer of electric vehicles, and Volkswagen are all demonstrating success with batteries that do not require these metals. The companies that I mentioned, BMW, Volvo, Renault, Google, Samsung, are thinking ahead and know that they won't be needing metals from the deep sea. New technologies such as lithium iron phosphate and sodium ion batteries are already becoming mainstream. And with innovation happening rapidly, the battery chemistries are are coming up. These battery chemistries are coming up. There is also the economic argument for not trashing the ocean floor for minerals. Economists note a couple of things. One, the projected cost of deep sea mining has not taken into account today's inflation. The speculative miners are still pitching economic models using interest rates from several years ago now. And two, it seems that the mining industry themselves argue there are enough of the metals the miners want to violently rip off the seafloor on land. So much so that the price of cobalt and nickel, for example, has gone down since 2021, with nickel mines even closing in Australia. And this is testimony to the fact that there is a shift away from cobalt and nickel-based batteries, since demand seems to be falling. For these metals, right? I'm not talking about all precious metals, but for the ones that, we're, that they are eyeing in the deep sea. Um, so prospective investors are being fooled, but the truth is when an industry starts receiving capital investments, those shareholders will be hell-bent on creating a market for these metals. And that is a tragic experiment we want to avoid. Time is running out to stop this industry. The good news is that because of the pressure brought to bear by all of us, the Council of the International Seabed Authority decided to push forward a decision on whether to open the deep sea to mining uh, to July 2025. In this time, they hope to finalize a mining code. And this is good news because it means that our voices matter. The other bit of good news is that the current Secretary General uh, who has a well-documented bias towards the mining industry, uh, is going to be replaced by a new secretary general who will assume her position in 2025. And this new secretary general is an oceanographer by training and comes from the UN uh, Environment Programme. So hopefully she will err on the side of caution. The thing is, we have the agency to stop this disaster from starting. And we must bill build on the groundswell resistance to deep sea mining and ensure that it is not allowed to go ahead. And this brings me to the Ocean Hope expedition. For the past four years, I had been campaigning to stop deep sea mining. When I began working on the issue, there was no country, I believe, that was speaking out in favor of a moratorium on deep sea mining. Today, 32 countries are either calling for a pause, a moratorium, or a ban on deep sea mining. And last year, as I was traveling to the UN uh, for the, the High Seas Treaty negotiations, I launched, launched a petition calling on world leaders to secure a moratorium on deep sea mining. And that petition got over 340,000 signatures in just the first four or five weeks. This was amazing. And I urge everyone listening today to go to our website, theoceanandus.org, and sign the petition. But we must do more. We are not talking about deep sea mining the way we would about any other impending disaster. Why? Because it is not interesting to media or even governments since it does not concern sovereign territory. We now have under one year to significantly increase support to stop this speculative emerging industry. And on my way back from the International Seabed Authority in 2023, I thought about how we can make the deep sea come alive for people. 
Of all the ocean issues I have worked on from overfishing, illegal fishing, pollution, climate change, whaling, you name it, deep sea mining is the most terrifying threat to our ocean. The urgency of the campaign is real and the window to stop this disaster is closing. If we think about the collective value of the high seas and the new era of colonialism and ecocide that deep sea mining in our global, global commons represents, it is clear to me that we simply cannot afford to let this happen. Let us for once consider the collective value of a natural system, truly protect something for the benefit of all of humanity. So the idea of the Ocean Hope Expedition was born. The Ocean Hope Expedition uh, connects people to the ocean, engaging with key stakeholders, including First Nations, scientists, tech companies, universities, conservation groups, and fishing communities to gather support for a global moratorium on deep sea mining. And this collective declaration will be presented to the International Seabed Authority in 2025. So your institution, business, or community can already sign the declaration by visiting our website. There should be a QR code for that in these slides. And the plan is to visit communities up and down the coast between Alaska and Chile. I will be joined by local, regional, and high-profile people to discuss the ocean, what it means to them, questions they have, poems, art, songs they want to share, because it's so important that we connect people to the ocean, meet people where they are at when it comes to the ocean, and by connecting through the stories they know about the ocean, whether it's kelp forests or salmon far, uh, you know, or salmon fisheries or farms or, you know, any ocean issue you can think of, the great whales that swim along the, the, the Pacific coast, the corals in Central America, all of that is connected to the deep sea and we must explore those connections and show why the deep sea matters. And why the Pacific Ocean? Well, the Pacific Ocean will be ground zero for deep sea, uh, for deep sea mining. Communities, local authorities, and businesses along the Pacific Rim have a vested interest in safeguarding their backyard. The Ocean Hope Expedition will unite people for a common goal of preventing the next climate disaster. Our entire journey will be chronicled on social media and amplified by our ambassadors from the music, art, and sports world. Preventing the next disaster is one of the biggest levers of hope we can offer people around the world that are feeling the helpless and by the multitude of crises that we face today. But why do I feel qualified to travel to the Americas to talk about deep sea mining when I'm not from there? Just, I didn't start the presentation with that, but I'm actually based in the Netherlands, in The Hague, um, and so not in America. But the, that is the beauty of this campaign. The high seas belong to all of us. I'm not coming over to tell anyone what to do in their, in their own waters or on their own land. I'm coming to warn of the perils of deep sea mining and unite us, whatever our backgrounds, sectors we work on and so on, there's, we have a common goal and that is protecting our global commons. These waters they wish to destroy are mine and yours. So for the Ocean Hope Expedition, we have some great partnerships that we are developing, for example, with Earth Percent, a climate foundation powered by the music industry as well as with leading sailors such as Team Malatia, the ocean race, uh, Brian Eno, the founder of Earth Percent, who's also a music legend, uh, is personally supporting this project. Donna Grantis, an amazing guitarist who played in the band with Prince, has joined us as an ambassador, and as has professional offshore sailor Rosalind Kuiper. So I hope you too will follow and support our journey, and we literally cannot do this without support. Normally with a campaign, there's time to rally funds, support and so on, but not with deep sea mining. We have one year to make a difference. So if you have ideas for other partners, then please do get in touch. And if you wanna learn more about deep sea mining and the threats posed, I recommend a short film that I, I initiated and co-produced. It's called In Too Deep, The True Cost of Deep Sea Mining. It's only 18 minutes and it's on YouTube. Uh, we talk to scientists, but also to industry such as BMW. So the plan, pending funding, is that uh, that we come to Alaska in the spring of 2025, and I hope to meet many of you then. And if you have ideas, again, as I mentioned, on who we should approach, what events might be interesting to speak at or to attend, or if you know high-profile Alaskans we can be in touch with, please let me know. 
that really matters that we if we can get local voices to speak on this issue as i was talking to sarah just before the panel just before this discussion started that there is nobody actively working on this issue in alaska so if we can identify local voices that can help amplify this that would be amazing so i just want to come back to the high seas quickly um and the new treaty as of today, 13 countries have ratified the new treaty for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, it's the official name. But we need 60 countries to ratify it for it to come into force. And whilst we should not let deep sea mining begin at all, we should certainly not even consider mining the high seas until the treaty is in force and has been up and running for a few years um, for it to be even effective. Otherwise, what is the point of years of negotiations if it cannot adequately address the issues of our time. And this is not just important for deep sea mining, but for all the future activities that may develop on the high seas. And what makes the high seas so exciting to me is that they make up half our planet. We have so much yet to discover on the high seas. It's like exploring a whole new world. And as we innovate and the blue economy takes off, I believe we will be seeing a lot more activity happening on the high seas with population growth and diminishing land availability, including land lost to climate change, we will increasingly look to the ocean. It is very likely that we will start to occupy the high seas, whether on or beneath the waves. Imagine floating cities at sea, underwater research stations, resupply centers all at sea. It is therefore so important that we enter this world with caution, armed with knowledge and good governance structures. Most of the treaties we see today were negotiated in the last century. They do not reflect the needs of this and future generations. They do not consider the biodiversity and climate crisis. They do not consider feminine or indigenous perspectives. They are unfit for purpose. With the high seas, we can get it right. We can ensure that the treaty governments have spent most of this century negotiating is swiftly ratified and entered into force. We then must ensure that the treaty takes precedence over archaic instruments. It is exciting to know that this new treaty considers traditional and indigenous knowledge and gender equality, but for now, these are just words. The proof will be in the implementation of this treaty. So I just quickly want to mention, I mean, I, if, if, if there's interest from this audience to learn more about the ocean, I can recommend uh, my book, The Ocean in Us. This book explores all the ways our lives interact with the ocean and provides suggestions of what we can all do to improve ocean health. Topics include the role of fish in the carbon cycle, shipping, overfishing, noise pollution in the ocean, ocean tourism, the aquarium trade, the deep sea, obviously, emerging topics such as the blue economy, gender in the ocean, and marine animal welfare. And it's not just my book. It, it brings together the expertise of over 35 ocean specialists in 32 informative and inspiring chapters, each written in easy to follow language. And it was, it's really something that I produced because of the many requests that I received uh, from people, lay people, not necessarily ocean experts, asking where they can learn about the ocean and all the many different ways our lives are affecting it. Um, but to close, these are the things you can do specifically to help deep sea mining, a bit of a recap. As an individual, you can sign and share our petition. As a business, community leader, association, or any organization, you can endorse the declaration against deep sea mining. Consider what events are coming up in 2025 that we can participate in, or maybe you can help organize one. And if you are able to, please give what you can. I'm not salaried, and I'm speaking here because I'm committed to the cause, not because I'm being paid. Um, I hope my reflections have offered you new insights about the ocean, and hopefully secured your support for the movement to stop deep sea mining. Please talk about this in your spheres of influence. Saving the ocean really is a matter of our own survival. No matter where you live on the planet, your daily life is affected by the ocean. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we're gonna open to questions, right, Sarah? <laughs> Yes, thank you for that excellent presentation, Farah. And yeah, I think we're ready to move now into the Q&A. So if you haven't sent in your questions yet, please do so. Um, I think I'll start with a question um, that I have about, um, there's a project um, off the Gulf of Alaska, um, Northern Bering Sea, 
um, that's looking into the impacts of um, bottom trawling, which you mentioned. And um, I guess they're looking into the environmental impacts and it's a supposed like experiment to find out the impacts of bottom trawling where it's currently banned. Um, and I was wondering how does bottom trawling compare to mining and perhaps could such like a, a project or a study like this lead to permits for deep sea mining and exploration? Sure. Well, I, I don't know the specifics of, you know, uh, the, the waters, the bo bottom trawling in Alaska. What I do know is that Alaska boasts some amazing deep sea biodiversity uh, with the, um, the, the canyons there, um, what are they called? The Bering uh, Canyons. It's a long time ago that I went to Alaska to to um, to actually campaign for their protection. Um, but bottom trawling takes place in many different marine environments, from shallow waters to the deep sea. And uh, yeah, it, it depends on where bottom trawling takes place that informs the damage and destruction that will happen. But I can imagine that in Alaska, we're talking about deep sea bottom trawling. And so this will impact deep sea ecosystems in a similar way to deep sea mining, right? So some of the um, uh, the areas that are bottom trawled are by by their very nature are very diverse biologically because that's where the fish like to be, right? So the fish they want to catch are going to be in in uh, in in biodiverse rich areas, and so these heavy, you know, um, uh, tr trawling machinery basically they they drag these nets over the seafloor and they destroy everything in their path, and even when they claim that they fish just a few centimeters or so off the seabed, you have to imagine that all these growths on the seabed, they, they, you know, they can grow several centimeters, if not meters up uh, uh, um, above the seafloor. So it is highly destructive. I, there's a movement in Europe to ban bottom trawling altogether. I don't know what that is in the U S whether there that movement, and I'd be happy if someone else had had more information about that um, to get bottom trawling banned, but it would seem, you know, that that's, I once had a discussion with a deep sea fisherman about uh, bottom trawling and he said, well, I, I don't understand what's wrong with my industry. You know, it make, I get a living, I make a living from this. And it was actually a Norwegian fisherman, deep sea bottom trawler. And I, and I said, and he was a very nice guy. And I said, but, well, but do you ever go back to the place where you've been fishing? And he said, uh, no. And I said, so why not? I mean, why don't you return to that place? And he said, well, we, we keep, you know, we, we keep fishing new areas, areas. And I said, well, that's called serial depletion. You're not going back because there isn't anything there. You've destroyed the habitat. Those fish are gone. That habitat is gone. And, and that kind of uh, opened his eyes. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, Sarah, but it, to me, it seems that everything we know about uh, deep sea bottom trawling, it's something we, you know, we should, we should be very careful about permitting um, and and certainly apply the precautionary approach to where it's allowed to, to happen. I mean, there are some rules under the UN pertaining to high seas bottom trawling um, that, you know, uh, accommodate thresholds for, for uh, amounts of coral or sponges that fishermen take up in their net. And if they reach a certain thresholds, they have to move on to an, to another area so as to protect the area that they encounter these corals and sponges. I don't know what those rules are in Alaska, but um, yeah, personally, I think we shouldn't be tra bottom trawling at all. <laughs> Thank you for that for that story. I also want to touch on um, what research is there. Obviously, what we do know about um, deep sea mining is obviously it's not good for the environment at all. But what research is there and what is maybe needed to understand more of the effects um, and could more research, you know, be, be more of a case against deep sea mining? Well, so there is, there's enough research to suggest that deep sea mining is going to cause irreversible damage, is going to impact the, the, the you know, systems in the ocean, like I just mentioned, you know, that we just discovered that these nodules produce oxygen. Today, I was reading a new paper that uh, about mag magnetic, uh, magnetic bacteria around these nodules that uh, help these nodules grow. And these nodules have taken millions of years to form, right? So they're not a renewable energy source. We know that. they Once they're gone, they're gone. Um, but 
with each, because I think I mentioned that most of the deep sea is not yet explored, right? So with each expedition, we are we are discovering new species. We're discovering new, um, you know, new science. And I would argue that the burden of proof needs to be on the miners to demonstrate, to prove to us that deep sea mining is not going to cause damage because there is enough science to say that it will. How much science do we need? It's a bit like the climate crisis, you know? I mean, are, are we going to, are we going to, you know, keep doing science before we do any action until the last fish is gone, the last tree is felled? You know, how much science do we need? It's it's uh, it's pretty clear that this is destructive. Um, and of course, the more we have to keep doing science to understand the importance of the deep sea to life on Earth, we have to keep doing science for the for the sake of biomedical reasons and, and you know genetic diversity, you know understanding genetic diversity in the deep sea. Um, so there's many reasons to do science, but I, I don't know that we have to keep doing science to prove that deep sea mining is destructive. I think the burden of proof should be on on them to prove that it will not be destructive. Uh, because also science in the deep sea is very costly, as you can imagine. So it's very few governments actually have a budget to go and do science in the deep sea, which is why a lot of is a lot of deep sea science is left to private institutions um, and and uh, and companies, um, prospective mining companies, and that is also you know that's not independent science. So we have to be careful there. Right. Thank you for that. Um, I see one question um, from Jacob. You mentioned deep sea mining for nodules containing cobalt, nickel, and manganese. Is there an active market for deep sea mining of oil and or gas? And if so, what are the immediate risks of this industry? Oof. Um, so, I mean, deep, deep sea oil and gas, um, uh, I guess it's not called mining, but it's called, uh, yeah, like, uh, like drilling, I guess is a, maybe the, the better word, does hap happen in uh, national waters in economic exclusive zones. I don't know that there's any deep sea mining happening on the high seas. I don't think there is because, again, the high seas don't belong to any one nation. So no, which country would have the rights to um, to exploit oil and gas on the high seas. I, 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 in fact, I'm pretty sure there is no high seas oil and gas, um, uh, drilling for oil and gas. But yes, for sure, there's deep sea drilling for oil and gas in national waters. Um, there is also no body to regulate oil and gas uh, activities on the high seas. There's the International Seabed Authority, which which is uh, which is um, um, concerned with uh, mineral extraction from the deep seabed. Thank you. Yeah, um, we had another question about where we can find the statement of scientists opposed to deep sea mining. Um, sure, that is a good question. I think it's called. Um, I will look it up because, um, and I'll put a. Can I put a link somewhere? <laughs> in, send it in the chat. Yeah, I can just it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, feel free to ask the next question. Sure. Um, I also wanted to touch on, um, I know Norway's government has approved a, a proposal for exploration for deep sea mining, um, and that's in the Arctic Ocean, right? But as you said, the oceans are, are one thing and waters and currents don't follow country boundaries. But is there anything um, maybe significant about mining in the Arctic ocean and the ecosystems that you could touch on? Yeah, so I mean, this is the Arctic is an extremely important fishing grounds, right? And uh, unfortunately, as we're seeing also the ice melt, there's increasing um, interest in exploiting the Arctic for fish, but also for oil and gas in, in national waters, obviously. Norway wants to uh, mine um, deep sea, you know, minerals from the deep sea in their own waters. Uh, and this is this is so controversial because unlike mining on land, which I think many in your audience are perhaps more familiar with, particularly if they are from Alaska, um, I'm not defending mining on land, but it is a discrete area that you're destroying effectively, but that you can also regenerate if you do it properly. You can also contain the pollution. You can be efficient at the, you know, in terms of mineral extraction, and you can regenerate those areas. You can also audit those areas and ensure compliance. Um, and you can also, you know, ensure things like uh, 
good labor conditions, whatever. I mean, these are all up to us to ensure, you know, as businesses and as governments to ensure these things work well. In the deep sea, that there, none of that is going to happen. As I mentioned, the the impacts of noise pollution, the dust storms, these sediment plumes, they're going to travel for you know, hundreds of square miles beyond the mining sites. And this will impact areas outside the Norwegian um, economic exclusive zone. These, you know, the, the, the risk is that this will impact um, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, so in the high seas. And that means it's going to impact uh, a global, you know, resource that belongs to other countries. Um, I don't like to call call life on the high seas resource, but that's the kind of technical jargon. But you know, it will impact life uh, also in the high seas. Um, and so, for example, I was mentioning fisheries. We know, for example, that deep sea mining from two two studies at least that have been um, published so far. And again, deep sea mining doesn't happen, but these are uh, qualitative studies. Um, these studies demonstrate how deep sea mining is going to impact fisheries, for example. And I think one study shows that, you know, tuna catches in the in the central Western Pacific Ocean uh, could be impacted by as much as 15 percent. So the, the value of that tuna. Um, and so similarly, there's that that fear that deep sea mining in Norway is going to impact fisheries in the Arctic. Um, and, and you know, fisheries is a multi-billion dollar industry. The EU is not happy with it at, at all. In fact, uh, the European Parliament voted against Norway's decision and I, are, are, you know, are urging Norway not to go ahead with deep sea mining in their own waters. Because, you know, if they want to destroy their own waters, it's one thing, but it's going to impact the high seas in the Arctic as well. By the way, the, the it's seabed mining science statement.org seabed mining science statement.org uh, you can also find that link if you go to the ocean and us.org and find the petition uh, the endorse the declaration I think that the qr code goes by here sometimes um, on that page is a link to the science statement also a link to the finance statement so uh, several dozens of uh, financial institutions have uh you know, are, are, are calling for a pause to this industry and don't want to invest in deep sea mining. And then there's also the business statement, which, you know, electric vehicle companies, gaming companies, tech companies have also signed, pledging not to source metals from the deep sea, uh, but also supporting a moratorium on deep sea mining. So there's, you know, there's, there's a space for everyone to add their voice uh, to this movement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I will include um, all these links in on our webpage and also in that email with the recording of the webinar. Um, is there anything else, any last questions or anything you'd like to touch on before we wrap up, Sarah? Um, no, no, I, uh, I mean, unless there's more questions. I wanted to do, I did want to, I don't know if people are interested, but I did want to mention something about um, ecocide law, which I think may be interesting to some of your viewers. So, and this is because it's quite new, uh, it's quite, um, it's been in the news lately. Um, so there's been a campaign underway to get the International Criminal Court to recognize ecocide as the fifth international crime. So at the moment you have war crimes, you have crimes of aggression, you have genocide, and you have crimes against humanity. Those are the four internationally recognized crimes that are prosecuted at the International Criminal Court. Um, and this campaign underway is to get ecocide adopted as the fifth international crime. So this is amazing news and also something that was not, you know, sort of believed possible just a few years ago. But now we have uh, at least three states that have um, tabled an amendment to the Rome statutes, that's the, that's the official name, where these uh, crimes are registered uh, to get, yeah, to get ecocide adopted as the fifth crime. And so uh, this is exciting news because it means that you know, if it if it, it will take a long time before it comes to pass and is actually, you know, um, you know, adopted as a law and and uh, and so on, but it means it it offers a deterrent for people for individuals to go out and mine, uh, you know, mine the deep sea or do anything else that is going to be detrimental on um, on a large scale to our ecosystem. So it has to be something that will, ecocide is defined as an act, uh, as an activity that causes uh, widespread and long-term uh, severe damage to ecosystems. So 
um, yeah, but deep sea mining we know will cause widespread long-term damage. We know that before it even begins, so it is actually a willful activity to you know in terms of destroying our uh, our environment, our one and only planet. So I just wanted to say that because it is it is exciting news uh, to finally see ecocide being spoken of at such high um, high levels. Oh yeah, so I wanted to stop on that that slide. <laughs> That's why. Um, yeah, but you're going to share the links anyway, so maybe. Yes, yeah, and I'll share, yeah, the links to the declaration, which anyone can endorse, yes. Yeah, um, and on this site is also the all, all the links to the petition, links to the financial statement, the science statement, and the business statement. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Svera, for joining us and for the work you're doing to protect our oceans. Um, there was a question about a recording and the recording will be available on our website and um, sent to your emails as well in the next couple of days. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks Farah for joining us and we will see you next month for the next Chalaska webinar.